This begins part two of our Monday Thursday worship service. In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me. Lest by base denial I depart from thee. When thou seest me waver, with a look recall, nor from fear or favor suffer me to fall. With forbidden pleasure should this vain world charm, or its sordid treasures spread to work me harm. Bring to my remembrance sad Gethsemane, or in darker semblance cross-crowned Calvary. Should thy mercy send me sorrow, toil, and woe, or should pain attend me on my path below, grant that I may never fail thy hand to see, grant that I may ever cast my care on thee. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I long to take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within a wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and burdens of the day. Upon the cross of Jesus my eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my contrite heart with tears to wonders I confess the wonder of his glorious love and my unworthiness. I take, O cross, your shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. My sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all his cross. In this hour of trial, Lord, we pray that you would intercede for us as we intercede one for another, particularly those on the front lines, those essential workers who bring sanctity and safety and healing and your presence, Lord. <clears throat> we continue our reading. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> then Jesus told them, This very night... You will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd. The sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples 
said the same. May we take a moment to meditate on that passage as well. So thinking about Peter's denial, if I had been there, I probably would have been Petros, who at that moment was not a rock, but denied that he knew the Lord. Even hurled an expletive when they said, yeah, we recognize you, you've got that Galilean accent. I didn't even know the man. And then he was brokenhearted. But in accordance with John's gospel is restored in the resurrection as each one of us have opportunity to be. Verse 36 of Matthew chapter 26, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch. Watch. And pray. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. And then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of, the, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. In the hour of trial, Lord Jesus, plead for me and for each one of us. May we pray. Heavenly Father, as you allowed your son Jesus to go to the place called Gethsemane, the place of the press where olives were pressed, he was pressed for each one of us. He experienced in that moment the agony, the Stress the distress that we feel here as the created ones. And he experienced all of that, praying that the cup would be taken away and then yet knowing that at the same moment when he prayed that, that he would have to obey his Father's will. 
Help us to be the obedient ones to go and to minister even within the constraints that we're facing right now. We have opportunities to minister to those who are fearful. We have opportunities to help others move from fear to faith and to live in faith, Lord. So anoint us, empower us, utilize us so that we might be those who reflect the Shekinah that comes only from God the Father through the Son and by the presence of the Holy Spirit to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. May we continue to meditate on that holy word. We continue our Monday Thursday meditation. Jesus told his disciples when they were sharing that meal together in accordance with John's gospel. He did some tremendous teaching, empowered them by saying he would send the Holy Comforter to be with them when he was no longer in bodily form. He said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. May we love one another, not because it's an emotion or a feeling, but because the Lord has commanded us to love with Phylos, brotherly love, sisterly love, and agape, self-giving love that comes from on high. In our meditation, I've been reading from an old book that fell into my hands. <clears throat> Michael Card, who recorded that beautiful song that many of you are familiar with, um, Joseph's song. Had a whole album of songs that he recorded, and then he wrote an accompanying book that talks about uh, some of the aspects of Jesus' life. And this is from his meditation on page 152 about Gethsemane. When Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, he was already bloody before anyone laid a hand on him. He had been fighting a battle that would make certain the final outcome on Calvary, 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 the place of the skull. Without Gethsemane, there could have been no Golgotha. The water and the blood that flowed from his wounds on the cross were preceded by bloody sweat that poured from his pores as he suffered the agony of a death more painful than the physical death on the cross, the death of the will. Gethsemane literally means place of crushing, a place where olives were crushed for their oil. That name took on an infinitely deeper meaning when Jesus knelt down there to pray that night in the garden. He was both a man and a child in Gethsemane, full of courage. It was a man who faced not an uncertain death, but one that was fully known to him. And Jesus looked the at the father in the face with mature though anguished honesty, and said, if there is any way for this cup to pass, let it be so. The torment of the garden was the confrontation between the son whose perfect obedience came crashing against the human desire to say, my will be done. Jesus began to die in that garden. May we take a moment to reflect on that. May we have a moment of silence meditating on that word. Jesus began to die in the garden. Did Jesus want to go to the cross? The Garden of Gethsemane tells us no. <clears throat> Obedience is perfected not in doing something you want to do, but in doing the very thing the last thing in the world you really want to do. That is why his sweat flowed with blood. A man knelt in the garden, a man of unspeakable courage and obedience, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And yet a child also knelt down there to pray. We hear the tones of a child in Jesus' plea, Abba, which is Aramaic for father. Abai, anything is possible for you. Jesus' words sound like a child's cry to his father for help, not a theological statement about an all-powerful universal being. Every father is, at least for a little while, 
omnipotent to his children. And so he was a child screaming in the darkness as if he were having a nightmare. Only this was not a dream. And Jesus cried out, Abba, never let anyone clothe that word in theological sophistication. <clears throat> it is not a sophisticated word. It's baby talk, Papa, Daddy, Abba. They are all the same thing, the first stutterings of an infant, not to be categorized in some systematic theological structure, but to be cried out from the heart of a child, a heart of faith. Much has been said about the suffering of the cross, physical, emotional, spiritual agony. The agony of the cross, the crushing torment of it, was the separation Jesus experienced from the Father, the result of his obedience. And that painful crushing began, appropriately enough, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so, as we think about that prayer that Jesus prayed, let this cup be taken from me. I can't help but think that we all kind of feel like, I wish I could wake up and it would be 2019 again because we're experiencing a painful cup. Not in the same way Jesus did, of course, but our own sense of struggle and suffering. When we hear of someone who's died because of COVID, oftentimes it's reported in numbers, but between and behind every number, there is a person and a family. And it's crushing. And so all we can do is simply say, Lord, heal, restore, take away this pestilence. But in the middle of it, give us courage to face it as Jesus faced what he had to face. Give us courage, give us insight, give us wisdom. Give us those six feet separated divine appointments. We ask you, Lord, to empower and to strengthen and to comfort all who have experienced loss, and especially those who self-sacrificially offer themselves in essential services, no matter how or where the offering may be offered. People always wonder why it had to be a friend. It probably could have been anyone who betrayed Jesus, turned him over. But it was Judas who volunteered for the job. And if Judas had not, someone else would have. Why did it have to be a friend? Michael Card writes, this is probably based on one of his songs. <clears throat> why did it have to be a friend who chose to betray the Lord? And why did he have to use a kiss to show them? That's not what a kiss is for. Only a friend can betray a friend. A stranger has nothing to gain, and only a friend can come close enough to ever cause so much pain. And why did there have to be a thorny crown pressed upon his head? It should have been a royal one made of jewels and gold instead. It had to be a crown of thorns because in his life, in this life that we live for all who would seek to love. A thorn is all the world really has to give. And why did it have to be a heavy cross that he was made to bear? And why did they nail his feet and hands? His love would have held him there. It was a cross, for on a cross a thief was supposed to pay. And Jesus had come into the world to steal every heart away. Yes, Jesus had come into the world to steal every heart away. And why was it necessary that a close friend betray Jesus? Why the crown of thorns, that grim tribute to the humor of man? Was it really so vital to the final outcome? And why the cross? Couldn't there have been some other way for him to die? The, Trappings of the crucifixion have always puzzled me. 
he writes. And we'll continue that reading tomorrow. Ponder with me the weight of what the Lord has offered for us this day and this night in which we watch and wait with the disciples and we learn from their heavy eyes because they had had a tremendous meal probably I think seven cups of wine if I remember each one symbolic they were heavy with fullness and it was a burden for them to bear to be there and Jesus probably wanted their companionship knowing what he would face but in that moment it was necessary for him to be bereft and alone so that he could begin to experience the depth far deeper than anything that we would ever experience in life. Let us pray for new life in the church, new hope for the world, and God's love for all.